Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, in this presentation, I'm just like giving a very quick show reel on 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 this problem about uh, open sense graph interoperability and why we think about this transition from an interest group to a working group uh, in, in our you know like life cycle within uh, RDA. Uh, I am Andrea Manocci. I'm a researcher at the at the um, I, at East CNR, I work with uh, with with Paolo mostly, and uh, so like uh, open sense graphs. Like, like the origin is everything stems from all these big transition to, towards uh, open science. So, which is basically as a movement is pushing uh, everyone, like not only researchers but also institutions and policymakers, to devise and, and adopt. Uh, Tools and practices and and and, uh, and methodologies, so to uh, perform open publishing of, of research artifacts, and um, in, in in particular, researchers uh, are urged to uh, deposit research entities that go beyond PDF, which is traditional you know, uh, uh, scholarly communication, and and uh, towards the deposition of of a plethora of connected uh, entities such as research data, software, ideas, concepts tools and methods and results and so on and it, it, like specify semantic rich relationships among among such entities uh, among them and towards uh, and towards authoritative registries uh, for example retreat data orchid for authors and authorship organization are covered by greed for example and and projects and, and funding schemes uh, by Cordis. so there are a lot of, of of entities and registries that can be interconnected and all this information end up in a plethora of different services that are scattered across the web and as you as you certainly know like there are a lot, a lot of initiatives that spawned so to contribute and consume such information and uh, that because there's a great interest and unprecedented opportunities in contributing and, and consuming such information in order to understand and monitor open science, try to do better assessment of the impact of research and research itself, and also to perform quantity science studies and science of science analysis, meaning uh, trying to put research practice itself under the lenses and, and see what are the mechanics and the laws that, that uh, govern uh, research as a, as a social process uh, so like the main problem nowadays is that open science graphs suffer suffer from high fragmentation because as i was saying like the a bunch of services that pretty much are isolated and independent independently developed and devised and this translates to information silo because these are again like our island and and they seldom talk to each other which leads again towards the application of effort and low synergy because like basically day in day out the different initiative have to reinvent the, the wheel uh, from scratch and do a lot of similar tasks over and over again and which is even worse if you think about that often all these initiatives do not have a clear sustainability sustainability plan which means that if the initiative ceases to exist there's going to be a, a, an amount of information that that's lost which is you know, like a money waste and 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 and, uh, and time waste because all the work that has been prior and has been done goes to void and 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 the ultimate problematic that osgs have is that the high they are highly specialized they have uh, specific to the purpose and to the extent they are devised for so this kind of verticalization of osgs uh it it, it should be you know like mm, should be leveraged so to try to give a, a a holistic view of the of the of the landscape of the research landscape rather than a vertical one so try to put all all of them together to have a, a, a better complexive view of the whole research uh, um, phenomenon and these are the drivers that mainly drive us in this uh, interest group and this is the discussion we're trying to bring forward uh, 
one of the last um, endeavors we we had as a in this interest group was the try, trying to put together a position paper and this is the one that Paolo was mentioning before you can find it here and in uh, in this paper open science must interoperate uh, we we first drawn a, a classification framework across seven dimensions that that we came up with by analyzing um, a, a, a select a selection of, of different OSGs at hand, and it goes across these seven seven axes. So like research entities that are modeled by the OSGs, the applica applications that are served, the data sources that are integrated in the first place, the added value. So like what the, the the OSG at hand puts more like where's the where's the plus uh, the bit more that 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 OSG in particular gives to the to the data it delivers, and then uh, how the data is 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 provisioned to the public, so how how people can can consume the data that's that has been put together in, in the OSG, and uh, and finally the fairness and openness. Of uh, of the corpus, uh, like the first candidate we we have in mind as a working group, like trying to think about this transition between uh, between interest group to work group, uh, it, it's is all about interoperability. Is one it, again is one is, is is not the only one, but it's the one that at the moment we think we should prioritize, and the objectives about interoperability of OSGs uh, are mainly trying to capitalize on synergies and uh, so not to perform over and over again uh, the same the same operations uh, that are performed locally uh, up to now in the different initiatives and try to have OSGs as a backbone of modern or modern open science scholarly communication uh this can be achieved by agreeing a lingua franca so to support the uh, seamless flow of information across the different initiatives and this can be done at two levels of abstraction one is the information model and the other one is technological so from one side trying to maximize the flexibility and information exchange among different different uh, open sense graphs and the other one is is how like in hands-on to to implement that from a technological standpoint we did something similar within rda with um in uh, in past uh, working groups like scolix is a is a um, standard that has been devised within within rda and is a success successful example in the sense despite it was targeting a much simpler scenario because the scolix is a is a, is a protocol, let's say, to is a framework to that enables a uh, share of links between uh, data and literature. So the links that are between literature uh, papers and and research data. Uh, so in this working group, we should analyze uh, which are the customers and use cases that are requiring that are. Uh, uh, Requiring the transition towards full interoperability of OSGs, and trying to understand which are the research entities that are needed, so to so to uh, satisfy all the all the use cases and uh, and uh, problematics the different customers might have at hand, which means also to study the context, the and the peculiarities of uh, of all these problems and um, and. Uh, Ultimately, ultimately, it's it's um, we need to understand which are the standards that make avail that make possible uh, these um, these seamless exchange of links and information across different initiatives. So uh, I'm done for this in, in introduction uh, talk, and uh, like moving forward, we will have uh, six uh, no, five uh flash talks and uh, and we will wrap up at the end with a uh, session and a brainstorm so stay with us uh hope you you, you will enjoy the this this new community thank you andrea so um kate if you want to uh try and share your slides andrea you should stop to share the sharing because otherwise we keep on seeing yeah it's, that's fine presentations thank you very much uh, if you have questions, please write them in the Q&A uh, or write notes uh, in the common 
uh, document. Um, I'm going to move to the next uh, before uh, Kate starts. Can you can you share your slides in the meantime? Okay. Before Kate will start, I'm going to to move to the next slide uh, of the Mentimeter. So, uh, if you uh, want to, please give your give us your feedback. That would be uh, very important. It's about the seven uh, axes that we identified in studying open science graphs. Uh, the one that you prefer most, or the one you believe are more relevant. So, and move on. Thank you, Kate. The bow. Thank you. Can Can you hear me? All right. And yes, we can. Is that it? Okay, thank you. It's tricky when you can't see the, the screen. All right, so very, very quickly, um, I want to walk through and kind of actually highlight this issue of fragmentation and siloing that Andrea was mentioning. Um, my focus is going to be on providing a literature service database perspective, representing both PubMed Central and PubMed at the National Library of Medicine in the US. Uh, I'm going to look at what we've done to sort of aggregate data links to articles and expose those. And I think it highlights some of the challenges that we're, we're getting into and even getting to the point where we could provide a graph uh, that's more useful to uh, the general world. Um, we operate two biomedical literature databases at the NLM, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with our resources. PubMed, it's our citation and abstract database. It's a discovery resource that's highly used and a very rich source of metadata and linked data for articles. PubMed Central is the full text archive uh, um, that we hold for articles. It's really a resource uh, for ensuring access, interoperability, and reuse, as well as preservation. But having this, this full text in this structured format has made much of the linking work that I'll be talking about today possible. Um, our interest here at NIH uh, is really with connecting and exposing the data, uh, both because it's an NIH uh, priority to do so, but also because we very much appreciate that the literature is how researchers are getting to the data, and it's how they're evaluating data for reuse. So we see our role here um, in kind of trying to build these bridges. A few, oops, a few years ago, we, um, we rolled out what we're calling the Associated Data Box in PubMed Central. It concatenates and aggregates sort of all of the supplementary material, data citations, and data availability statements that we can identify in the, the full text. And it makes them really prominent and tries to get, make people aware that they're there. Uh, data citations, we, we identified early on as a really clean way of building these links between publications and data sets using permanent identifiers. We actually released guidance for data providers um, in October of 2017 based on jats for our guidance to do so. Um, here. What we've found, though, is that despite annual growth, these data citations continue to be found in less than 1% of articles that we're archiving annually. Um, supplementary material or material, supplementary material in combination with data availability statements remain the most common type of associated data um, that we're graphing with articles. And I think it's, it's fairly obvious to state that this, this creates a lot of problems. Supplementary material are, very difficult to work with when you're indexing data sets for discovery or building any sort of graph. They don't have any meaningful or indexable metadata. They pose a number of issues with interoperability and preservation that are sort of out of scope here. And they frequently lack any sort of permanent identifier that we can use for building links. Um, we've tried this at um, in PubMed Central by assigning a global unique identifier to supplementary materials that don't otherwise have a PID, but I'm hopeful this is an interim solution. I don't think it's necessarily um, something we want to build on too much. I've been optimistic about the growth of data availability statements that we've seen, but this uh, research project that some associate fellows did at NLM last year was sort of a reminder that even when a data availability statement is present, there's a lot of challenges in graphing these these items together. They're frequently pointing to the article or the supplementary material or the author as a source for, for the data. And that's a long time problem that just seems to be perpetuated. 
perhaps unexpectedly and getting into sort of the fragmentation and silos, the data linking that we do in PubMed uh, from the article records is entirely separate from what we're collecting in PNC. Uh, so in the new PubMed that we released last year, we took steps to make it easier for people to find uh, data set identifiers that are associated, um, but then you still have to look across various sections, and that's because we get these links from various sources. So uh, associated data includes data set identifiers from publishers as well as our own indexers. We also have our own NLM and NCBI databases that kind of backlink to the literature. So GenBank, Geo, you see those links and related information. We also accept links from uh, external data repositories. So generalist repositories like Figshare and Dryad are provided to link out. Um, and we also work with other NIH databases. You see the, the National Cancer Institutes here. The final linking source that we've been exploring um, to sort of graph these publications to data sets um, has been the authors themselves. Uh, we rolled out support for NIH investigators to provide data set links to publications last year. This seems pretty straightforward in theory. Uh, authors should know where their data are, um, but in practice what we've received is really messy. Um, so we've we'd had plans to incorporate these data links into PMC but we've been holding on that until we can identify some clear rules as to what to include. Um, so to, to wrap it all up, this is all to say that um, NLM is uniquely positioned through our, through our roles of an archive, our publisher relationships, our repository relationships, and even our tools that we make for authors, I think to bring a lot of these connections together and work to create um, a slightly better uh, system for doing this but um, we are still not to the point where we can get all users to find all the related data they want in one place. Um, so that's kind of a priority for us in the coming year or two. And we're hoping that that solution can have wider applicability to these sorts of, of efforts. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Um, and I will, here's my email if you have any questions outside of this discussion and I will turn it over at this point to the next presenter. Uh, while the next presenter shares the slide, can you please quickly, uh, uh, Isamir, the next presenter, can you please, please uh, quickly tell us, uh, is there any effort in standardizing the way you can collect information from other systems to enrich uh, your own information at your own PMC. So is there any such an effort going on? So um, at this time, we're, really, we're assessing some extra, so, so there's two pieces. Um, we're, we use our link out program that I mentioned at the end there um, as one way of enriching. We've also considered to Scholix. What we're very curious about is to what, to what extent we overlap with Scholix is to what we are already aware of and where it may supplement. Um, and so I think first we'll try to bring together what we have. <laughs> uh, we're a little bit, that, that's actually been harder than we expected. Um, and then I think the next step for us will be to explore even additional resources that we may be able to pull from. Amir, uh, the, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Paula. So just to confirm, you can see my screen and the audio is working. Right? Okay, sounds good. So um, uh, the seven minutes talking about the research graph, what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on a kind of application of building graphs like this and what we do in some ways research graph team and uh, the, the whole venture that we have done in the last uh, five or six years was more about using these graphs rather than producing them although we have to be we have to be a kind of a graph provider in our own infrastructure but we also struggled a lot with finding the data with collecting the data with linking and harmonization so that's going to be actually the core part of this discussion and also when you do all of these things how it's going to be useful so research graph today is um, is a 
distributed graph database and mainly holding JSON formats. But we basically have a concept of frequently building the new Forger graph databases out of that. Uh, it's currently about 316 million nodes and 617 million relationships. Uh, there is a lot of different data sources into this. I'll mention this later. But a big portion of research graph is what we call it open research graph. That's really what also Martin would tell you about a PID graph. That's probably the closest to the con conceptualization of that, that you can think about this. So it's really the open part of research graph is all connection between identifiers. And we have links between the researchers, research data sets, organizations, grants, and publications. Now, when we are start basically building these kind of graphs back in 2016, 17, publications was just academic articles. But now we have a large corpus of gray literatures and technical reports, and even some of the social media content and traditional media records are in system. I'll, I'll mention why and how these things are integrated. Um, now, generally speaking, we are doing three different use cases or three different uh, areas of activities with Graph at this scale. We are having, basically, we have a line of research in the domain of studying collaboration networks. Uh, we do a lot of knowledge mining by reading the content of PDFs and basically the graph help us to find the related documents and also related data sets and also the data discovery. Now, uh, this is a kind of infographic of how our team uses the graph for operating our projects. Basically, although this looks like an interface, but most of these operation happens top of the Jupyter Notebooks, REST API, and Dockers on the cloud infrastructure. But basically, we harvest and collect information from a number of different open repositories, and we have integration of closed data. And our closed articles, technical reports, data sets, I think more than 99% all are Australian content. So we are very much focused on our research in Australia. And also, I forgot to mention that I'm also working for uh, St. Ben University of Technology, which is in Australia. So most of our team are actually located in Australia. But we also have collaborations in Europe and US. Now, what, the, what this system provides us is that the capability of getting all of these different links to different articles. And then we basically run microservices that tries to actually find and map geospatially information to a given ge geographical area. The sort of questions that we're dealing with is that we, for example, supporting research about mental health or social resilience in a given city. So we want to know the databases or data sets about that kind of uh, research in that area. We want to know all the policy documents related to that topic about Australia. So we need to have a context that city of Glen Ira, for example, is this uh, Australian city. Uh, we also need to have the capability of policy documents and social media related to that topic. So that's really this whole infrastructure for us supports a place-based research by pulling all of those links into basically one platform. Now. Basically, I can classify the sort of activities happening today related to the research graph uh, ecosystem. We are doing the research related to the public health. That's one of the active domains. Social well-being and social isolation, uh, sustainable community and waste. That is one stream of our work. We work a lot around the information resilience uh, in different sectors, and we work with public policy research. So you can guess that it has a a bit of humanity and social science flavor into this, but we also have a health flavor because of the public health. And uh, PubMed Central, for example, is one of our key sources of data and articles in that research. Now, this is the just to demonstrate the sort of projects we are doing. This is one of our work related to the coronavirus collaboration network. This is started from a PhD student type project and then a significant growth to a much bigger activity. Now, this is a, this is one of the subgraphs that we pulled out of the research graph. This shows a coronavirus research in 2009. And in 2009, we identified there are 1,500 research organizations across the globe working on this topic. 
moving forward, uh, um, we can see in December 2019, the number has been increased to 3,200. And as you see, there are different countries coming to the graph as time goes on. In 2020, the number suddenly jumps by the factor of three. Now there are 9,000 organizations in the graph. That's where, for example, a lot of uh, papers and articles joined into the ecosystem from Brazil. Um, in April, the number of research organizations goes to uh, 1,500, uh, 15, sorry, 15,000. That's where we get a lot of uh, publications from China. Then in June, the 27,000, Germany now is a big player. Uh, in December 2020, uh, that's 46,000 research organizations in the graph. Now, I don't have the actual figures until now in front of me. I actually use our slides from Peter Palooza conference. So um, yeah, this is not the last, latest up-to-date number, but it is until December, 2020. Uh, now, this is just example of sort of projects that we do and sort of applications of the graph. So we basically use the same content. We use a topic modeling and natural language processing to slice and dice and understand what papers are published on what topic. But one of the, things that related to this um, uh, interest group is, okay, how we can actually interoperate, interoperate with other graphs and how we can actually exchange information. One of the things that we were pilot testing this right now is opening up our Augment Graph API uh, on Azure. Uh, and uh, as you can see, basically it gives you exactly what I've shown you in the COVID graph, uh, you can actually put the ORCID organization, the ORCID user, ORCID researcher, and then you can get all the collaborators and all the organizations attached to that. Now, it is a good idea. However, the problem is that scalability and sustainability of these services, uh, the scale of the graphs that come back are computationally expensive. So opening these APIs to a larger audience is always a challenge in that scale. I think on that note, I can just finish the presentation by saying that if there are three things to address in this whole scholarly communication uh, space is we all compute things that often are get double computed by different partners. So if we kind of whatever we compute and link, if we can share those links, we can reduce the amount of computation required to refine and actually perfect this kind of modeling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Again, if you have questions, please write them in the Q&A so that our speakers can, can reply, okay? Um, so next in the queue is, uh, sorry, I lost the agenda, is Martin. Martin, would you be so kind to share your screen? Of course, and I have been struggling last two days, so wish me good luck. <laughs> oh, yes. I'll show you. In the meantime, the results of your um, uh, of your uh, classification <laughs> uh, preferences, and we'll discuss them later on on Mentimeter. So can you see my first slide? Yes. It's confusing that I don't see it. I see it in <laughs> what you share. Okay, so I will spend hopefully not longer than the next six minutes um, introducing to you Datacite Commons. That is a service that Datacite launched in October of last year as sort of one important output and also at the end of, of a grant funded project called Freya uh, in the European Open Science Cloud. And there are some basic ideas in there. Um, pit graph is sort of the conceptual model how we built the graph and sort of connecting to what Amir said in his presentation and the name obviously uh, implies that every node in our graph has a pit and not just a pit that we made up, but it's sort of a commonly used pit and I will show the pits we used in a moment. And the metadata for these pits 
um, have the connections to other pits. So a basic a sample would be a data citation between a DOI for a publication and a DOI for a data set or a connection between a researcher with his or her ORCID and again, a publication. The technology we use to build this graph is called GraphQL, which is a widely popular technology that unfortunately is not widely popular, popular in the scholarly community. So happy to have a discussion following the session if other people are working with GraphQL and want to share experiences. But this is a sort of query languages for APIs and that is a really nice fit for exploring a graph, uh, as, as the name implies. Although it also works sort of for, for much simpler API calls, it is basically for many people is a replacement of REST APIs. And then finally, uh, that's the API to sort of show these graphs at the sort of web interface where users can go and uh, work with this graph is called data set comments, um, which of course uses GraphQL. And that's sort of a, there's a very nice integration with uh, many JavaScript front ends and we're using React, which is currently the most common one. Um, I will give you one example of what we can do, and it's just because we don't have much time. And also, this is a much newer endeavor, so the number of use cases uh, is sort of very small compared to what, for example, Amir was showing you just a moment ago. Uh, something where we are fairly strong is identifiers for organizations. We use the Research Organization Registry, ROAR, and um, this is, for example, uh, the URL is sort of in the lower right corner, the landing page for the University of Cambridge uh, in the UK. And what we show there is many things related to the University of Cambridge, which is, for example, all outputs with DUIs that we know about, and that could be cross ref or data site DUIs. This is particularly easy for data site DUIs because the um, University of Cambridge is a data set member. Sorry, so most of the 67,000 research outputs come from Cambridge, from the institution repository called Apollo. Uh, but you can see, for example, the first entry here is from another repository where the uh, affiliation, uh, one of the authors has an affiliation unit of Cambridge using the raw identifier and the metadata. Um, what we can do then is sort of aggregate all the research outputs from research from this university and then do additional things with them, which could be, for example, here the aggregation, what's the total number of used downloads and citations, what's the percentage of open licenses. You see this in the donor chart. Um, that this is sort of the green part, which is about 20% or so, and the exact numbers are in, on the left. Um, and you can also track yeah, so other follow-up events where something that's quite common is, is reuse in, in, in the form of used downloads and citations. And you can see this both for the video data set, if that information is available, use and download is a lot of extra effort. And you can also see aggregations. And then, of course, you can also filter this by, by year, et cetera. So that's the kind of typical use case that we try to address in, in this service, where at the beginning of the FRAIR project, we spent quite some time to figure out what use cases people want to solve and um, sort of what are the priorities. And of course, uh, research output by the institute is, I think that you will all understand that that's the case that many people of Cambridge, for example, in this case, care about and do all kinds of extra work of this defining patterns of sort of what um, domains pro produce uh, strong outputs, finding connections to other um, universities, etc. So that's more for discussion of what you can sort of 
high level overview and sort of suggest at the end of what we can do to move forward with making these open science graphs better work together. So this is just piece we have in the graph. And that's not surprisingly very similar to what showed. So we have publication data sets, people, organizations, software is probably the third most interesting output um, for many people right now. And funding, and then I hope you can see the, the number of connections between these um, entity types that we find. So for example, 6 million data citations, half a million data set uh, associated with a particular researcher via their ORCID and DUI, et cetera. Notebook, so these are the numbers from yesterday, I think. Uh, you, can, you can tweak this graph. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are well, not only for AMIR, but also for GraphQL APIs. So one interesting question when you want multiple together and sort of some decisions that are made. And I listed four common technologies for queries, uh, which is REST APIs that um, research graph that is using uh, Sparkle for um, queries in an in RDF context, GraphQL that we are using, and Cypher, which is the query language for Neo4j, which is a very popular graph database. And I think um, it makes a huge difference to, to sort of combine different open science graphs, uh, what technology decisions they made here, because this is not just the query API, but maybe also the underlying technology, whether, for example, we use Neo4j as a database, or in our case, we use relational databases and Elasticsearch um, indexes. And that's already my last slide. I propose that there are sort of two ways forward with integration. One is um, if other graphs use the same technology, there are sort of many shortcuts you can take in our case if somebody is using graphql there's interesting you can interpret and specifically a federation we are doing this sort of in our graph internally uh, everything related to research organizations or orchid is not actually stored in our system but this is sort of um, called out to respective apis which are rest apis and we sort of build a graphql layer on top but that's not really possible if you want to interact with, for example, a system that uses Sparkle. You can again integrate this, but this sort of this becomes really cumbersome when you go more detailed. So the alternative is to have a sort of, let's say, a low-tech approach. At the end of the day, a graph is nodes and connections or edges, if you prefer that term. And you can basically this is in whatever technology you use for your system. Uh, the node information, which in our case all have PITs and standard metadata, that's basically REST APIs for these um, PIT providers. So for example, uh, DUIs for data sets or publications or ORCID for people. So that's widely available and, and, and uh, widely used. And the connections between these uh, nodes are um, not currently widely available, um, but the colleagues approach, which is specifically about connections between a publication node and a data set node, that's um, a model that can also scale to uh, support more entity types. There's work needed if, if we start with this colleagues uh, schema uh, to be flexible enough for these graphs. Um, but exporting this as a data dump in an API uh, will enable reuse on a sort of much lower technical level that makes it much more flexible, which also makes it much uh, easier to reach something that is working. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Then we'll, we, I see a lot of questions coming up, so we'll probably answer them later on. But um, so let's go to the next speaker, which is Marcus. Uh, Hello, everyone. Hello, can you? Share your screen here. Yes, I can perhaps also change here. 
I leave you all alone, yes. The source and then um, share the screen. Good, I hope you can see my slides. Um, so uh, welcome to this um, hopefully brief talk. I will try to keep it um, to the seven minutes um, on the Open Research Knowledge Graph. I'm Marco Stocker from the TIB Leibniz Information Center of uh, Science and Technology. And uh, the Open Research Knowledge Graph is a project that we are developing at uh, TIB largely with some other um, partners. So um, we have seen a digitization in research. Um, what used to be for quite some time in print uh, is today in digital. But uh, in a way, the way we do it uh, hasn't really changed a lot. We have a title, we have authors, abstract, and largely text and images and tables. Um, and uh, this is a little bit in stark contrast to what we have seen elsewhere, um, where we have had a digitalization, a process of uh, creating information systems with content. So the what used to be in catalogs in print, um, you don't have simply the PDF uh, online today uh, to browse. You have uh, uh, today Amazon and other catalogs of products, which of course are information systems that provide a complete new uh, way to interact with this kind of uh, information. You can rate it, you can um, sort it, you can compare it, um, you can uh, have recommendation systems and so on. And same for other types of information, um, geospatial. Um, we didn't just uh, print um, the, the printed maps. Um, we, we don't have just put uh, PDFs online. Today we have uh, open street maps, um, Google Maps and so on that provide again information systems and complete new ways to interact with uh, geospatial information. And the question is why hasn't this happened in, in the scholarly communication? So what the open research knowledge graph tries to do is to apply the fair data principles to scholarly knowledge, where scholarly knowledge is essentially content published in papers, so the items of content in, 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 in papers, and make this kind of knowledge findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Here's an example, we have a paper on the left, classical uh, first page, and um, it describes a certain research work, and on the right you have a, a landing page for, for this uh, paper in a with some of the essential information encoded in a structured machine readable form. So you have some metadata at the top, but then you have some uh, research contributions. These are the tabs here. So one paper can have a number of research contributions and each contribution is uh, expected to address some problem. And uh, it uses a certain set of methods, materials, and um, yields some results um, about this um, problem. And uh, this can then be described. Uh, and an example is here. So here is a research, uh, a sensor network used as a research material in this uh, piece of work. And you can see that the network itself is described over several paragraphs, um, hard for machines to sort of relate all this information together. Um, and in OR ORKG, we do this um, with a, as a structured information object. The sensor network has a location. This could be a geonames identified resource and has a set of sensors uh, which are subsystems and each of these sensors can then be described for what they measure, um, information sheet and so on. Um, what you can do when you have something like this is you can start to compare the information published in the literature. Here's an example for the case fatality rate, the hazard ratio of uh, the B117 variant. And we have essentially extracted um, the values uh, and confidence interval locations and time intervals of the study um, for now three papers here. And then you can um, generate this sort of um, comparisons, overviews uh, for the research and the um, results um, of this research, um, published research for a particular research problem. And um, yeah, you can more easily determine what is currently the state of the art, for instance, uh, who is the best, best performing algorithm um, based on precision recall figures, or then also create some products like here. Um, again, visualizations for humans now, you can uh, of course plot these values um, very easily. 
Um, so we were asked to talk a little bit about the data model. The data model in ORKG is a high level because the entities, what exactly is the material methods and result in research are very diverse and you can describe this in very diverse manner. So we have a, a very simple overall abstract schema that has a paper, of course, has metadata and there's a title and so on. And then you have data, a set of research contributions. Each contribution is described um, for the problem that's a, a resource described um, in its details, but then a set of materials, methods, and results uh, for each research contribution. And of course, now you may wonder, okay, uh, how do you describe these materials? And this is the community that has then, can you leverage uh, ORKG templates to describe um, specific items of content and how you describe them. So for instance, here, the basic reproduction number, and uh, value estimation, uh, so it has a value and um, for instance, a confidence, and then you can describe the confidence that are all having um, lower and upper bounds. Um, exchange protocols, we have a REST API, we have a Sparkle endpoint, these are published, and we have recently experimented with GraphQL, and this is to be released, I'm coming uh, to this in a minute. Um, so we use Neo4j, Martin has already mentioned the database, quite popular. We have some data in Postgres and we also use OpenLink Virtuoso. So we have a REST API that powers essentially the React frontend. Um, it also is used by a Python library, which then powers reuse of the um, content published by ORKG in things like Jupyter Notebooks, for instance, to compute the mean of, of some uh, values in, in a comparison. We have a GraphQL endpoint, which um, links then to PitGraph, and I have more to say in the last slide about this, and then the Sparkle endpoint get, that can be used. And my last slide is about the proposal, and we have experimentally with this, um, to have a GraphQL federation. So Martin mentioned the PitGraph that integrates off of data side, cross of ORCID, ROAR, and others. Um, and the ORKG, we have now both uh, systems have GraphQL APIs, and we can now sort of crosswalk uh, data from metadata published by the PitGraph to data in the literature published by the ORKG, and then ask uh, more complex questions, like for instance, the mean hazard ratio of the variant here, as published in papers that have a certain number of citations. Um, so you can see that the mean hazard ratio, uh, this comes from ORKG and, and the number of citations uh, from the pit graph and we com combine these things in more complex query. Thank you very much. Again, this is, I think, a very interesting case because uh, it uh, let us look at things from a different perspective uh, and uh, should be uh, indeed considered in the in the use case uh, that we're trying to uh, uh, approach and solve. So uh, I think I'm the last one to present and uh, if I can find my presentation, here it is. Can you see it? Okay. All right, probably not full screen. Wait a second, let me first give it full screen and then I will share it. Okay, there you go. Okay, so the open air resource graph. Um, so first of all, uh, um, as many of the activities that have been mentioned here, uh, this graph tries to bring together uh, metadata and links coming from different sources. Um, we are collecting from many, in fact, of the uh, uh, sources that have been mentioned here. Um, European C is one of these, or, and uh, uh, the research graph from Amir, where we exchange data and we already established relationship. Uh, there's a lot of work going on with data site as well. So. Uh, the graph that we're trying to build brings in uh, information about all the research products that you see on the right, publications, data sets, and software, cross-discipline as much as possible, and um, tries to link uh, this with contextual information, which uh, is uh, the organizations, the communities, like the disciplines, but the communities as well, which are a kind of different entity encompassing different disciplines, different uh, subjects. 
um, projects uh, uh, which are in turn related to streams and funders. So we have uh, both the uh, results of science and the, let's say the tracking part of science. Uh, so the graph is mainly used for these purposes, measuring research impact uh, on different fronts, social and uh, scientific and, and economic where possible, where we combine patents, for example, with services and so on, uh, and discovery where these can be tackled and across disciplines, so that's the challenge. So things to mention that are important. We, uh, we don't care about PADs in the sense that we take them all, right? So we're collecting from all sources that are minting today uh, persistent identifiers, but we go beyond. We, uh, as uh, Amir mentioned, we really care about uh, other kinds of gray, lit gray, gray lit literature that is being produced out there. Um, uh, like technical reports, uh, the, the deliverables, but also presentations, and we try to bring all this uh, together. Uh, so this is a huge effort, which, as you may understand, requires a lot of massaging of the data, right? So the, the collection that we build is open, as uh, all the ones that you've heard so far, so you can collect all the content. It's complete in the sense that we try to cover all the possible sources out there which are relevant to scientists. So. Uh, and I mentioned a few, but of course the Crossroad, the Unpayable, the Microsoft Academics, as well as other graphs are included. So we try to bring in everything that is useful to scientists. It is the duplicated. This is one of the major challenges that we are facing because we are collecting the same metadata information. Uh, so the, the metadata information about the same objects from different sources. So we have to bring them together, building richer objects and taking advantage, of course, of the contribution that the different sources bring in. Um, we want to be transparent, so we provenance for us, it's important. And again, we uh, are trying to track provenance, which is something common to many of the open science graphs uh, out there when they try to collect. Um, we are decentralized in the sense that we are trying to send this information back to the original sources. So we have the tools and the mechanisms that once we collect the information from one source and we merge it with the other sources or we enrich it thanks to the mining and several other actions that we're doing, we can detect what we uh, added to the original source in terms of metadata and send it back to the original source. So the extra links to data sets, the up-to-date list of links, uh, in incoming and outcoming links or open access versions, links to projects, whatever we find, we can send it back to the individual data source. Um, now, uh, this is roughly the workflow that we are following. So we are collecting today from 2,400 sources directly, which indirectly means around 99,000. And uh, the amount of records that we collect is quite big. So it's uh, it goes close to 400 millions. And we harvest and mine 250 bilateral links. Um, this is the harvesting and mining. Then from Skull Explorer, we are getting close to a billion, roughly. At the same time, we collect also 14 million PDFs, on top of which, as you can see later in the queue, in the chain, we uh, apply 13 algorithms and, uh, and more are coming, because there's always something new to do, which we are um, uh, using to enrich the graph, to further enrich. So first we collect, then we deduplicate, then we enrich, and the final result, uh, these are the figures uh, for April 2021, uh, we export it to the world, also through our applications, because we have, of course, monitor applications uh, for um, institutions, for funders. Uh, we are today serving 32 different funders, each of them giving us their individual projects for which we mine the links to the publications. Uh, but we give it to the outside world and to other services. One of them is the commission, and then we are uh, collaborating a lot with Elsevier uh, on a subset of our um, uh, of our results. We are collaborating with Springer, we are coll collaborating with ACM, with several companies, and many other uh, stakeholders in the research domain. Also, the researchers, which are taking our data to uh, perform their uh, investigations and, and studies. So, as you can see in this process, we are collecting data, so we have a problem of tracking who gave us what. We are manipulating the data, so the OSG uh, that we are producing is affected by our algorithm, which are not 100% correct, as all algorithms uh, 
cannot be. So we need, we need to track, um, for example, the trust or the level of precision of this algorithm and make it part of the graph as well. So we call it trust internally. Okay, And then we also export this graph, which is quite complex. Uh, if you look at it from the um, Chris uh, perspective, and we had to pick our model on how to export the graph. So this uh, slide uh, gives you a vague idea of what's going on, but we are collecting through different protocols. In many cases, in a few cases, fortunately, uh, we are using we are have we have to deal with proprietary formats in the sense that these are. <laughs> Uh, specific APIs that have been provided by our partners uh, and we are adapting our workflows uh, to them. Uh, APIs and formats, so that uh, is something that is sustainable only to a given extent. Consider that Microsoft Academics, for example, for those who are familiar with it, changes the way the information is exported from time to time. So you need to revise the whole uh, workflow. Exchanging and taking, in this case, information from these sources is not easy. Then once we export it, we do it through different standards. We do it through SparkUL, we have REST APIs, we have data dumps in Zenodo. Uh, and again, we had to adopt a model that would describe everything that I mentioned before, uh, so that users and uh, consumers could uh, profit of the data as best as they can, uh, as they could. Uh, at the same time, we had to make choices. So our uh, schema, our uh, uh, data model is again proprietary in a way. So people need to adapt to it, right? And that's uh, not something that we want to do for the future. So we need basically to start thinking uh, of a world where we can exchange data by speaking the same language, starting from the entity properties, what do we want to share about a publication or an organization or a project? We, of course, need not to reinvent the wheel in this sense, but we need to agree on uh, how to share these wheels. And uh, uh, the same goes for provenance, uh, which has to be somehow described. We have several ways of doing this. Uh, sometimes they are overloading right, the, uh, the, 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 the data exchange, so we need to be pragmatic at the same time. And the same holds for schemes, uh, as in the case of open air, many others are bringing into their world uh, different schemes and they have to cope with these, uh, let's say, meta descriptions of multiple disciplines according to multiple vocabularies. The same goes for languages and relationships. So um, let's say overwhelming uh, the expressivity of any data model and trust, as I mentioned before. So these, I think, are some of the main uh, uh, aspects we need to debate and we need to discuss uh, in this domain, and especially in uh, the working group that we would like to uh, open uh, today. So, um, I think uh, I am done with this. So, if you, if you uh, have questions, we can start replying to the questions offline, uh, sorry, online, and we have uh, a number, which I think are very interesting. Uh, so there's one for Amir who, that started the discussion, in fact. Uh, can you see the, the Q&A, Amir? Can you briefly reply so we can all have a chance to... Uh, to yeah, watch can do. Uh, the first question as for me is that uh, talking about duplicated computing and how easy and how useful it would be to enrich one open science graph with another. So uh, one thing actually is that this is exactly how the research graph completes the data. So as Paul mentioned, we get the data from open air, we get the data from the peat providers, we also get the data with a whole bunch of open access repositories and publishers and so forth. But each one of those metadata records that we get is almost look like a small pieces of a graph that all comes together to create a bigger one. So in some sense, that is what we do. How is it going to be useful? Well, at least that's enabled us to do what we do right now. Uh, but that is, I think it's, so this is about getting the data from other sources, but deduplication is a different problem. Deduplication is when we have multiple variation of the same node in different sources. And the challenge of this is that sometimes the metadata related to that item is varied from source to source. 
uh, with, the, with the traditional publications that they got DOI, that's usually is not a problem. But where it can be the problem is that when it is things related to the people, organizations, funding uh, grants and projects, when it relates to the, some of the technical reports, and deduplication, deduplication is quite expensive in that round. One of the things that we are already dealing with in the grant kind of part of this project is related to the deduplicating organizations. That is the one that right now takes a lot of time from us. And that's one of the things I'm quite interested if anyone else who is interested to work on it, to collaborate with you guys. Yes, I tend to agree with this uh, reply. Um, it's probably one of the other things that we need to somehow uh, describe. Ian, would you like to uh, add something to your question? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think this is basically a question to all of you. How much would you be willing to take uh, information from other graphs? How would you incorporate it? Mm. Would you use it to confirm the information you have collected somewhere by your on your own, or would you just uh, take it over and um, use it to make your graph more complete? Okay, uh, Amir, uh, I may, can, you, can you mute? Oh. Okay, you yeah, understand. Um, so. Uh, I think you may have different reasons for doing that. Uh, for example, in open air, we do it all the time. We just track who gave us what, so we know where the information comes from. So if you access the uh, open air graph, you will see that this bit of information comes from Microsoft Academics. And so the, this is the very first uh, thing that we do. When we, sh when we collect the data, we do it because it enriches what we have. Okay, and that's the first thing. So we, we collect information that we couldn't otherwise have from anybody else because these guys building this graph are very good at this, right? So they're good. We don't need to reinvent what they're doing and we collect it. Then we also collect it because it is the ground for us to maybe come up with something else with extra information. So that's always useful. You start building from... Uh, somebody else. And it could be, in some cases, what exactly you mentioned, a way to uh, verify that you are aligned with somebody else's thinking, right, which is always important. For example, the numbers. When you calculate the ratio open access versus non open access, it's important to, to see if you're aligned. And if you're not, then you need to ask yourself questions, right, and see uh, who's wrong, where, where are we wrong. So this is the good of open science in the end, right? So it's the, the way that we can validate each other and be transparent to what we do. Um, like to give a different answer? Yes, and I think. That's basically because our graph is built on pits. In most cases, there's an authoritative source for a pit with providing metadata. Uh, and that makes it very easy and of course limits uh, information we can collect so it's it's a design decision, if you will. If there's a DUI on Orchid or Roar, then there is metadata in one place, of course. So that that's what we're using in, in our graph, at least uh, at the, for the time being. I, uh, but I think we will be busy collecting more pits from other sources. That this is a, a way that we sort of yeah will keep us busy for a few more years. So the information that comes with pits is a little bit more reliable than the rest of it, perhaps. Thanks. Okay. But it's basically um, a lot of ambiguity is sort of, is not needed. So making decisions about if you have a bit of open air store, having information from five different sources, deciding which one you take, um, PubMed, and maybe Catherine wants to say something about this, is a special place because there is sort of very strong metadata, highly curated that for things that also have Crossref DUIs, and then I think it's, it can get tricky. There are things that you will never get from Crossref, for example, or uh, maybe there's sort of, yeah, it's just different. And I don't, yeah, maybe Catherine, you can just rather say something. 
I think the the differences, for lack of a term, are um, partially who the record belongs to that we've hold. Uh, we've traditionally thought of it as the publisher's record in PubMed, and we we have a ver a few mechanisms for um, adding metadata, but uh, we'd really like that metadata to come from the sort of owner of, of the record. And so we see, we want to see PIDs and we want to work with publishers for that PID to be in their version as well as reflected in our index. And so I think for us, um, we're very interested in exploring how we could sort of supplement with open graph, but ideally uh, it wouldn't be as diffuse as it, it currently is. Yeah. I think there is a problem of trust and curation in the end. So even when you have a, a source like uh, Crossref, right? Uh, well, apart from the fact that you may have a lot of uh, DOIs that have been created just for testing and that's it, or, they, or DOIs that are not curated enough. The problem is when you start uh, adding information to it, right? So when you have, for example, citations or links to other objects, Using PIDs doesn't mean that you do it properly. So uh, if I take a look at, uh, for example, Zenodo, right? There's a lot of people uploading documents in, Z in Zenodo. What they do is to generate a DOI. So hopefully the metadata they include there is correct, okay? Uh, but then what they do is to link this material to other things, right? So they link their objects to another data set. So they cut and paste. Then they select, uh, uh, a relationship. Then they cut and paste their ORCID ID and put it into the field, which fortunately in some cases is the right field, right? It's not the name field, for example. So the information that we collect from a fig share, from uh, all these uh, repositories which are open to the world to be used, are kind of uh, to be rediscussed and reconfirmed. You cannot fully trust it. You have to, because that's the principle behind it. But it's better you double check. That's the idea. Okay, so it's not obvious. So I agree, this is why we need trust. We need a way to establish uh, to which extent you are confident uh, with the information that you're providing to the world so that who's using you can, that, can take that into account and apply certain criteria. When we collect from UK PMC, we're all, more, almost damn sure that if they have a PMC ID and the UI, these are effectively about the same object. If I collect it from the institutional repository X, I cannot make such an assumption, okay? And if I can add, uh, like in this very moment, we are working, for example, on ORCID, uh, in, like in our team, in a open air team in PISA. And um, because we like working with open air, we, we found out some things that are uh, going not as we would expect uh in orchid and 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 this relates tightly with with what paulo was was mentioning uh like when people uh deposit metadata about about um, publications they they do copy paste there's no cross check uh for example whether the the, the orchid is indeed the one is indeed well formed for 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 the starter and whether the 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 orchid id is indeed the one that's relevant for the deposition. So we found a number of, of, of inconsistencies in, in misuse uh, in, in using ORCID, and we try to document them in, in, a, in a paper. I can I can share the link uh, like uh, shortly. Uh, the, and also ORCID as as a problem, uh, like I would say, rather consistent problem on 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 fake profiles or like. It's hard to believe so, but yeah, we have fake or fake orchid IDs, uh, people that are trying to advert, I don't know, like car loans or uh, cannabis and uh, bitcoins and so on and so forth. And um, it's, inter it's interesting to study this phenomenon, like uh, try, to, try to spot them in a, in a kind of automatic fashion, but also try to understand what is the the social engineering pro like train of thought that 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 pushes people to to create fake or like mm, like misleading orchid accounts which you know like it, it's it to my eyes is it's baffling and like i wouldn't have expected anything like that but 
Yeah, uh, it happens. And um, so, yeah, like bottom line is uh, if it, the fact that speed, there's, there's a PID behind it doesn't mean that's uh, reliable. That unfortunately, we, any assumption we can make on that, it's it's prone to failure. Well, well I have to sort of let me quickly say two things. One, that I think what is true for PIDs and what we agree is, is provenance. So with ORCID, you can say some Uh, depending on what is linked. Yeah, that's really the person. Um, if it's a DUI, then somebody is a DUI, which can be the case of Fiction and Zenodo, is basically can be everyone. But if it's a university of so and so that has this repository, the publisher of so and so, that gives you maybe, as you say, more trust or the, if, if that province trail is there. But I wanted to say something else about Orchid and keep it short because we are sort of running out of time, which is. Um, Orchid is, is, of course, an example where um, the problem of metadata and what is, uh, is sort of is addressed by allowing um, multiple parties saying something about the provenance. So if you, if you look at an Orchid profile, you might have uh, the same record but contributed by five different sources, so university, the publisher of the article where you are the co-author and maybe two other places. Um, and that in some cases can give you sort of nuances in metadata that there are slight differences of what is in Crossref, what is in PubMed, what is in the institutional repository where there's a sort of green away copy. But so I think that's the cleanest way, but it's also a lot of overhead for science graphs. So if, if we add a layer of sort of there's sort of lots of different provenance for all these connections that it becomes quite painful to navigate. And I, I mean, I agree that sort of Andrea, what you said about metadata quality and fake profile, et cetera, but uh, I don't see this as sort of hindering us of using these identifier oh. and API. So I, I think on a practical level, these things, systems, we could, can get a lot out of this. And this is also open infrastructure. So I would would not forget that they're sort of a positive no, no, side. No, no. Yeah. All this is, uh, I mean, we're not saying ORCID is not useful. ORCID is key for the scholarly communication infrastructure. It's just that you should use carefully, right, uh, the material, because uh, in some cases, it's not as obvious as you may think. Uh, that goes for the UIs, that goes for any sort of PID. So there's always malicious uh, usage out there. The uh, sorry, uh, like someone asked me whether, uh, like, provided that ORCID suffers from some problems, like whether it was um, better to, you know, dismantle everything and reinvent a, a, a new infrastructure. And my suggestion is no, like, you, you should keep what you have. The fact that it has problems doesn't mean is is not enough to say okay just like rebuild something from scratch. Like you can you can always make the present a better place uh, once you study what's the problem, what are the malpractices, and, and so on and so forth. So like yeah, I, I'm I'm totally with you, Martin. Like we should keep the tools and infrastructures we have in place, and we should try to push forward and make them uh, uh, like more reliable. Than, than they are at the present moment. Can we take a look, since we have uh, the last 10 minutes, so if you look at the Mentimeter, uh, one of the questions was about which uh, are the, to, to how do you rank the research entities that are relevant to your open science graphs? And of course, that clearly shows, uh, uh, if you follow up in the chat, you will find the link, so if you want to vote, yeah, because this uh, slide had not as many votes as the previous ones. Um, but it shows, of course, publications, right? Uh, I I kind of happy about uh, services because uh, I think they play an extremely important role, especially in tracking science for reproducibility. So these are the kind of uh, information that we would like to have, uh, I think, uh, but that are probably underestimated today. So we don't even have PIDs for many of the services, apart from those that are kindly minted by data site, but. Uh, basis from registries and so on so that doesn't help much um, so if you want to uh, give it a last go on this because I wanted to ask you which are the other uh, entities that you think are key and crucial and should be taken into account in this analysis because these are the ones that 
we bumped in, uh, in in open air, right? So we also have the projects and others, but maybe there's something else that you think is uh, key and relevant, and we would like to know. Um, so if you're not into this, Marcus is not is not online anymore, but uh, I, I think it would. Uh, it would open up that because to to the old content of of papers because or 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 ORKG is all about what's inside the knowledge that is inside papers and not only the uh, scientometric or bibliographic record of uh, of of literature and whatever is a, is a, it's around literature. So like I, th I think Mark um, I, I think speaking on behalf of Marcus, it would it would. Um, open a bit more like towards the concepts research concepts and topics and um like i've seen yeah. algorithms and other things that yeah. are inside uh, so there's a question from diego but how are you going to move for the next step in this graph interoperability are you going to try and integrate federate the graphs presented today or are you going to discuss more in general some standard approach for the semantic and technological interoperability nice discussing a sort of upper ontology and prefer the technology approach e well yes Diego I that at least would be my opinion so what we would like to do for sure is to uh, start pragmatically from a subset like we did in Scolix define a model a data model that we trust starting from standards so uh, not reinventing the wheel again, which could be a good combination of uh, data size standards uh, or others using the domain and SCOLIX or uh, ROR to describe organizations. I don't know, a list of standards that would be preferred, let's say, that uh, these initiatives could, could adopt to expose their data. And of course, sharing also the formats, which could be JSON or whatever would be useful. So including a schema. And from there, start the discussion because you can share dumps in the beginning, but of course you can do more, like Martin was suggesting, for, for example, with uh, uh, APIs like GraphQL. And uh, sure, we can use our graphs as use cases. We are already exchanging information, but we are doing it on a very bilateral <laughs> uh, kind of interaction, uh, not based on any common agreement. Uh, Martin, Amir, uh, Kate? Slightly different answer to this puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the, the slightly different answer is um, sort of as an outcome of this session today, start a working group that is given 18 months to sort this out. What is realistic? What is too ambitious? Um, how can this be done? Because it's, I think with graphs, it's both very excited, but there's a big risk to try to overachieve and sort of to build the perfect graph where you spend 10 years of defining the data model and another five of sort of making something work. So, so I, I, I would leave it totally open what is realistic, but without a working group, sort of just as an interest group, this will, it's too difficult. So it's not, not just meeting for a short period of time and coming up with something, but this is really hard work. Yeah. But I mean, um, I'm not sure what Amir thinks or Kate, but we need to start from some concrete use cases, right? So for example, exchanging data between uh, uh, your graph and Amir's and ours and UKPNC and whatever could be uh, a good example. So what, what are the entities that we care about? Identify the entities, identify the standards that we believe should be used to share uh, context about these entities not limited limiting to the duis right like we did uh, with the scolix maybe a sort of small set of properties that we believe are enough to uh, manifest what the entity is right so and then start from starting from there i think it's actually very important so concrete mm -hmm. scenarios. amir so uh two two different things one is that um one of the Lessons that we learned is going back to that discussion around the uh, PITs. Not all, not all the metadata that we get with the PITs are correct. So a lot of actual effort goes into kind of completing those metadata or looking at that metadata from different angles. 
um, that's uh, that's actually more prominent if the if the actual item is not published by art by publishers. So except so basically there is a there is a category of publications or top publication by journals. They all have a right metadata. Anything after that goes into the haywire. You'd get a all different kind of um, variation in titles, variation in publication year, uh, when it gets to the organizations, all different names, when you go to the data sets, all different metadata related data sets. So, so I don't think uh, just exchanging the information about links would solve the interoperability problem. The actual metadata is of the individual nodes, at least to me, is quite valuable. The other thing is that apart from just exchanging the data sets, which I very much agree, and as I mentioned in my presentation, we are working toward a pilot API on Azure to exactly achieve that. Um, but apart from this, other thing is that uh, collectively working on problems that we already have. So there are that, that concept of linking different pits together, I think we all to some level solved it. It's not really, I think it's a new problem anymore. The issue is that when those connections is no longer in place, like if you have a grant and a publication that the citation is not there, how do you link it? If you have five copy of the same organization with different names, how do you deduplicate them? If you actually have a data set that have a, this is actually published in five different places, how do you identify these are the same thing? So there are, there, uh, the, I think the curation of these graphs and perfecting them, uh, we have a list of problems that I believe all of us to some degree, we are facing those and then we can work together collectively. So I, for example, on the research graph right now, I have about uh, two FTE research staff that are just working on organizations and we kind of got a breakthrough on this one. So I can share this one with the rest of the, colleagues and then we can actually work together on even improving these algorithms and i think that's that's something that would help the community as a whole uh, rather than each one of us have random projects working silo with some small grants from here or there we can collectively work together even collectively we can apply for big grants yes we we also made a lot of progress there so we need definitely need to to combine the efforts that's interesting, very interesting, Amir. Um, so um, I think there was also another nice question, but uh, Neil left. <laughs> and I noticed that he left. He was asking about uh, us sharing tools and uh, um, where is it? It's not that when you leave the meeting. Okay, are there any efforts to help create reference tooling and client libraries? to help researchers work with the different open science graphs being presented. So somehow to uh, have a place where all the resources that are required to handle with these graphs could be uh, found and nicely described, at least in a common way. So that was initially one of the working groups, the other working groups that could have been proposed. So uh, a way of profiling all open science graphs, uh, describing the tools around them and exposing a catalog where people can search and find and share uh, this kind of information. That would be, I think, extremely interesting, probably too much for the co-chairs of this uh, uh, IG and uh, WG, but if others would be willing to uh, take this road, uh, we would definitely support it. That's step two, probably, once we, <laughs> we describe graphs and we start exchanging them. Um, Paolo, sorry, just a note. I just realized we are running out of time here. I don't know if yes, it's the very suddenly point. terminates. I don't know how it works. Mm -hmm. So I hope it doesn't suddenly mm -hmm. just terminate. Anyway, thank you very much. We had also other input from you uh, of other aspects like protocols, uh, publishing venues. These are all part of them are contextual information to services. Others are effectively interesting things like the publishing venues which are missing from the picture that i mentioned before so i'll make a copy of this as well right and then there was uh, a very last slide but that was more for you to the last three takeaway notes um 
So in the meantime, I thank you all very much for this. Interesting for us. We collected very nice questions. And uh, uh, we, so we, we will, uh, in, in the end, as we wanted to do, we will open this working group, working specifically on interoperability of open science graphs, and we'll try to involve you all uh, in, the, in the activities. We're planning to have, uh, of course, meetings and uh, uh, writing, uh, starting writing a document together on which are the challenges. And whoever you wants to collaborate is, of course, more than welcome the overall idea okay so i thank all the speakers again uh, unfortunately marcus has left and uh thank you thank you all okay thanks paulo thank you everyone thank you thank you have a nice Bye. day and you